Let me know if you can't uh, hear me, but I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, and let's get started. I think uh, first, just take a moment to locate your chat box because I am going to be asking you some questions and hopefully we'll have some um, interaction. Um, every group different, every energy level is different, so I'm, I'm being mindful of that. Um, so just locate your chat box and then um, I also would like to ask you to um, write in there, just take a moment to write in there what you would like to learn today. Like what is the reason you're taking the time um, to participate in this, in this workshop, in this webinar? So if you can take a moment to do that. Um, and then also, if you could share with everyone your organization, um, where you're, you're coming from. So I'll, I'll give you a moment to do that. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to do that. We'll take a look. Um, so we'll get started. A little bit about me. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm always worried that I'm, I, okay, good. Um, so this is Chiquita. She tends to um, make noise while I'm trying to say the most important thing um, during a webinar or, or session, so don't mind her. Um, so a little bit about me. I have um, been working with Aparo CDC uh, for a while as a consultant, and I've worked with different organizations. Um, I've also attended at Mills College in Oakland, and one of the reasons I decided to, to attend that college uh, to, to pursue my MBA there was because they, they used a lot of um, up-to-date methodology, like the professors were, had a lot of um, experience in social enterprise. And because my background um, is a, a nonprofit, I've, I work for different nonprofits, um, nonprofit management, and also um, I love entrepreneurship and small business owners. And I've got like this mixture of like multi um, passions, I guess. Um, that's one of the reasons I attended Mills College. So um, just a little plug for Mills. <laughs> I also became a mom mid pandemic. Um, in April, I became a first time mom. So that was, that's been really fun um, to kind of experience. Um, and I, just to give you a little bit of a background, I work with the American Red Cross, Small Business Development Center, Evergreen Valley College, Postpera Co-ops um, in cooperative development um, in different capacities, uh, marketing, management, program development. Um, and yeah, um, and so, and I love supporting entrepreneurs and kind of not just supporting entrepreneurs, but helping them launch. And so I know that there's many people working in nonprofits that are very entrepreneurial. And so raise your hand if you consider yourself to be an entrepreneurial person. I'm sure many, yes, many of you who are working in program um, development, I, I, many times you're using all these entrepreneurial skills to be able to come up with different different programs and you're you're basically doing what an entrepreneur does um but you know for your organization for your nonprofit um and that's one thing that i loved about working with um business with um nonprofits and most of the time they were actually the work that i did was in starting new programs um the methodology that we're going to talk about today and i'm going to share with you is methodology that i used um, in developing a lot of different types of programs and testing them out. And one of the things that, of course, in nonprofits that we have to consider is the lack of resources, right? We don't just have millions of dollars to come up with new ideas or to implement new ideas. So this methodology is going to be um, not only a time saver, but also a 
um, money saver for for you and energy saver as well. So it's one way in which we can um, definitely have create all of these ideas and have a lot of ideas and not necessarily waste time and resources and um, in implementing them. And also, it's it's a good team activity. So I, I also want to want to share that with you. Like if you ever are in a situation where you have where you want to come up with different um, new ideas or you want to come where well, you want to see where you want to pivot your your organization or your program this would be a good methodology um, to use and so i want to go back to my chat and i somehow can't pull it up i'm not sure why but let's see did anyone write in the chat uh, okay, so we'll continue on. I'll go back to that one in a second. So about the business model canvas. Um, can, can I see a show of hands for those that have your camera on? Um, how many of you have used it before or heard about it before? Okay, okay. So the business model canvas has been around for over a decade now. So the uh, the original one was uh, initially proposed in 2005 by Alexander Osterwalder, and a business theorist and entrepreneur. So it was based on his earlier work on business model ontology. Now, this has been in the first time that I ever heard about it was from a blog on MIT uh, uh, from um, MIT. And so many times when we think about a business or starting a business or a business model, we think about this like super thick, complicated business plan or business um, planning session, or just like having a lot of um, information that we have to download from our brain to be able to like share it with another person, whether it's an investor, a funder. And the business model canvas kind of synthesizes all of that information into the most important key um, aspects of your business, okay? And um, so it helps organizations conduct structured, tangible, and strategic conversations around new business and existing ones. So you don't have to have a new business or a new program or a new, completely new organization to be able to use this. But you could start thinking about a new way of doing business, a new way of providing your, um, your services, a new way of um, relating to your donors. Okay, and I'm going to show you how. So this is going to be a very practical um, workshop. And so uh, one of the things that I want to ask of you is that you engage. Okay, and if you have questions, um, please feel free to ask um, if, if any, any of the things that I'm saying is, are confusing or, um, or you have ideas or questions or anything that you want to share, please do, um, do share. And so let's get started. So this is the original business model canvas and you can Google it just business model canvas and there's a, a lot of different templates that you can find, but essentially the, they all look the same. Okay, they all have the same um, components to it. So there are these nine boxes and there's also different versions of it. So the, but this is the, the original. So there's different versions, what I, I, I found, uh, a lot of different ones for nonprofits. I also um, found different ones for different types of businesses, but at the core of the business model canvas, this is, this is it, okay? And so one of the reasons that I emphasize on using the original methodology is because I have worked with organizations that tried using this um, canvas and I am thinking about one organization in particular that spent months working with this canvas um, and they actually did it all wrong. Okay, so they, they put all of this investment and time um, and resources in creating a canvas, but it wasn't, it wasn't, the methodology was, was all incorrect. And there is a correct and incorrect way of using it. So, um, so I want to make sure that you, that you um, don't spend all of this time using, using it. The wrong way so um so please ask away um it's actually pretty simple um but it's more about learning how to use the tool in order to implement your ideas okay so just kind of think of it that way uh okay so this is the original now one of the things that we're going to do today is we're going to go over the original then we're going to go into how this applies to nonprofits. 
and uh, we're going to do an example and we're actually going to do the example together okay because i want to know the way that it's landing for you um and we're going to come up with the with the um information together okay so let's get started we're gonna we're gonna look there is a process so we're gonna go with box number one which is customer segment and um and it as it relates to to box number two and it's pretty simple so you don't necessarily have to print out a template i know not everybody has the printer at home you can pretty much do this on a piece of paper and just and it has to be done in one sheet of paper and there's a reason for that and that is because you want to have all of the key information you don't want to write a full paragraph in any of these boxes because guess what it's not going to fit you just want to do bullet points okay there's a, and it has to fit in one sheet of paper okay so if you um it, yeah so like if you draw these little boxes on a piece of paper it should all fit and um they all should be in in these in this particular order so the first area that we're going to take a look at um, actually, let me preface by saying, so this is the original, okay? We're gonna look at customer segments right here. So we're gonna look at what we need to know about our customer and how we need to break down who we're trying to serve, right? And I'm speaking in, in, um, in business terms. So, so you may not call your, um, your client, your customer, a customer, it may be client, it may be your um, participant, it may be your student, depending on what kind of services you offer or what, um, how you describe your, your quote unquote customer. We're gonna take a look at customer segments. We're gonna take a look at value propositions. Um, we call it our mission statement or maybe our, 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 or what, or our uh, list of services or many of services that we offer. Many of you may call them differently. Um, three is going to be customer relationships, how it is that we're going to develop that relationship and not only develop it, but foster it through time and how, and what channels we're going to use in order to deliver the services. And um, not only that, but what channels we're going to use to continue that customer relationship. Um, number five is going to be income streams and um, specifically as it relates to our customer or our client or beneficiary we are going to um, take a look at impact okay number six is key resources what does it all take to be able to to deliver those services um, and key activities not only what what resources does it take but also the activities that we need to um we need to do in order for us to be able to fully function and number eight um key partners i'll tell you i'll share with you um, how to think about who a key partner is and who is not. Number nine in, and last is how much does it cost and what are our big cost um, uh, expenses that we are going to have to incur, okay? So that was in a nutshell what we're gonna be looking at today. My hope for you is that you're gonna be able to use this right away, okay? I'm still looking for my, um, here, let me. I'm still looking. Oh, here we go. Here's my chat. Perfect. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I wanna, I wanna see maybe what some of you are hoping to learn. Looking at new ways to raise money and fundraise. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. Looking at ways to improving your business of nonprofits to fulfill your mission. One page business plan. Yeah, this is it. Definitely. Um, yeah, looking for new ways uh, to raise money. Yeah, that's absolutely important. Okay, so well, let's get started. When we think about beneficiary segments, and I'm gonna be doing a lot of talking, so hopefully you have a pen and paper um, to take notes and hopefully you will ask questions if, if um, any of this is not clear. So beneficiary segments, when we think about who we're serving, think of it as a pie. Okay, so when we think about the market or our, 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 our market or wherever it is that we're going to be providing the services. So and one example that I give a lot of my uh, businesses that I work with and the organizations that I work with is and, and a lot of us have a really difficult time figuring out who our segment is. Think of it as a pie. Okay, so if you, for example, are in um, Monterey County, right, in Mon within Monterey County, um you have that's like the entire pie 
what you want to do when you're thinking about your segment is who specifically you're serving. And because of um, changing things out of our control, so for example, the pandemic right now, or economic um, um, downturns, or uh, you know, climate change, all of these things affect who we're trying to serve and, and what population we're trying to serve, okay? So one of the first things you wanna do when you're using the business model canvas is figure out who your beneficiary segments are. So I wanna know from one of you, who it is that you are serving. And, um, and I might start calling on people just because I wanna make sure that we know exactly what we're looking for when we're filling out this um, sheet, okay? So how about we start with Valeria? Hi, Valeria, um, let's see. Okay, can we see your um, Valeria? I can't hear anyone. No. Okay. How about um, Susie? The, um, can you tell us who is like one beneficiary segment or customer segment? I, what do you call your clients? Participants? Uh, yeah. Nonprofit leaders. Nonprofit leaders. Okay. Yeah. So, so you would say one segment is nonprofit leaders. Now, if, so one of the things that I want you to do specifically in this box is give me more detail about who that segment is. For example, I want to know what gender most of them are or how they self-identify. I also want to know what their values are, okay? What their values are. So even two or three things. So for example, somebody who participates in a, in a workshop or a webinar during work hours when they are really busy may value education or, or learning, right? So we wanna be able to identify at least two or three values from our customer segment or our beneficiary segment, okay? The other thing we wanna know is also, are we reaching for, in, in, in Susie's case, are we reaching nonprofits that are between um, half a between um, that have budgets between hundred thousand and five hundred thousand. Are we reaching um, you know ma ma management level employees, or are we reaching a, you know different level employees? So we want to know specifically who it is that we're trying to target, okay? And as for as much detail as possible. So in the nonprofit case, so you might have, and this is just remember this. We're just going over program um, and beneficiary. So these are the folks we are trying to serve, the end user. They are not necessarily where we're gonna make you know, money. This is where our metrics come from. And I do want, at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how um, you can use this model to figure out how you can also maybe start um, gaining some revenue from your beneficiaries, okay? Um, so anyhow, so one of the things you want to do is have these pieces of the pie and describe them in as much detail as possible. It's the same way that a um, that a small business or, or a company is going to describe who they're trying to reach. And the reason you want to start with this is because it, depending on what you write on here, it, it, it's going to affect everything else, okay? So you want to be clear about who you're trying to reach. You may have more than one customer segment. You might have three different customer segments. So for example, Susie's organization may reach management level um, nonprofit professionals. And she might also reach aspiring management uh, level prof uh, professionals, right? And she might, or she might reach um, specifically nonprofit um, uh, executive directors. Right, or she might reach people in accounting specifically, right, or or people in finance or in operations, not necessarily program, but she needs to know exactly who she's who she's reaching out to, okay. And this is gonna this can be I would suggest start with two, don't try to reach out to twelve different segment groups, okay. Start with two. Now start with one actually. You know, two would be the max, but start with one and describe and do a persona like you want to be able to tell me. Um, and this is, you know, homework for the follow up session. 
I need to be able to, in my head, know specifically who you're trying to reach. I need to be able to imagine them and, and see, almost like be able to see them when I close my eyes as you're describing them and get to know them, okay? I've spent a lot of time specifically with bene a beneficiary segments because that's how important it is, okay? So you want to be able to, and I'm going to list out some of the things you want to know about your segment. So you want to know um, values, you want to know um, a demographic. So everything that has to do, and I know this sounds, uh, it's not politically correct. You know, marketing is actually not very politically correct. So we're going to, we're going to talk about their, um, their gender. We're going to talk about their age, their income level. We're going to see geographically where they're located at. We also want to know what um, their values are. We want to know what kind of technology they like using and what kind of technology they don't. We want to know their family makeup, okay? So if you're starting to see the, a lot of people who come to participate, for example, in your workshops are um, between the ages of 50 and 60, then you want to be able to, to keep that in mind as you're advertising and as you're using um, you know, the right technology and, and communicating the right way. And then if you see that you know, a, lot of your, um, a lot of your beneficiaries are millennials or a lot of them are women. So we want to be able to know as much information as possible about them, okay? So I have a, once I have a question. Here, yes. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, so uh, I'm in the Kiwanis and so we go out in the community and we do things and have barbecues and you know fiesta and stuff like that and we raise money and then we and then we give it away most mostly to youth activities so is this beneficiary the one that's receiving you know the barbecued food or is this the the beneficiary that's receiving the high school scholarship so it could be two is it are they all the same people no not yeah. not generally i mean some somebody that might win a scholarship might buy you know, a chicken dinner, but, um, you know, typ typically it's the community raising money and then we, we turn around and, you know, yeah. spread that around to, you know, Little League and, you know, go on and on. Yeah. So you have several customer segments or beneficiary segments. And, and so if you start to look at who most commonly comes to your uh, barbecue and who usually receives the scholarship, you're going to start to see patterns. And you're going to start to recognize that you actually have a very specific target audience that's responding to the messages that you're already sending out. And what you want to do, because this is already happening, happening across the board for all of your organizations. A lot of the times I have people who are like, well, we're trying to serve everybody. Everybody needs what we have, right? Like where we're trying to offer. Everybody can benefit from our mission. Yes, and the messaging that you're putting out there is attracting a, a specific type of person. All you have to do now is identify who that is so that you can amplify that mess messaging and you can reach more of those folks, okay? And then if you're starting to see, I work, um, in, I work for a community college that was trying to reach out to um, w um, second language learners to provide um, English language uh, courses, right? And one of the things in our market research, one of the things that we realized was that a lot of folks didn't have transportation. They wanted to participate, but didn't have transportation, right? It was very specific to, um, to a neighborhood we wanted to reach. And, and that's what we learned. So we saw a pattern, right? A lot of folks wanted to go, sign, would sign up, but once the first day of school came, we knew they, were, they, they would show up the first day, but then the second day they wouldn't, right? Because they didn't have transportation. So we wouldn't have known that had we not looked at the data and interviewed people and really looked at who we were trying to serve and how we were going to serve them. So you want to be able to look at your data and hopefully you're collecting data, right? And if you're not, um, you you do want to be, you if you've been doing events already, which most of you have, or you've been already serving uh, a specific population, take a look at the things that you notice, right? About who is coming who is staying and who's meet, who's helping you meet your impact metrics, right? Who's help, who's making it all the way um, to the finish line? Because if you want to attract that type of person, you want to be very intentional about um, recognizing what, who they are, okay? Does that answer your question? Was it Ellen? Ellen? Okay, perfect. 
So, um, so you don't want to have more than two. Um, don't start with more than two. It can get this can get very overwhelming, and it can be very easy to be like, I just want to serve everybody. You can't. You cannot serve everybody. Like that's not an that's not an option. So, and also, yeah, it would just be too exhausting to try to serve everyone. Number and then the second thing you want to do. So once you've already identified your beneficiary segment. You're, the second thing you want to do is figure out what your mission offering is and if it, if it fits that beneficiary segment. These two things need to go hand in hand and they need to be worded in a way that is going to connect with, um, with that person, okay, that you are trying to reach, with that persona that you are trying to reach. And that is your um, mission offering. Now, some, um, can somebody give me an example of your mission offering? I want to hear how you would describe it. What is your, what do you, what do you provide to people for your, for your beneficiary specifically? So Susie reports that um, somebody in Molly's house thinks they saw a mountain. I'm sorry. No. Oh, I, I don't think they were talking to me, huh? <laughs> Robert. Hi, Robert. Are you? The, can you share your organization and what your mission offering? What do you offer the the beneficiary? What do you call them? Clients? Sure. Yeah, we call um we do both. We call them residents and we call them clients. Yeah. We we basically have two segments. Um, they're all. Um, special needs um, and or uh, development, um, uh, uh, developmentally disabled, um, some who live here, others who come in um, during non-pandemic times, but we're providing them services over Zoom currently, um, as well as our residents. So um, here's what we do. Um, at Gateway, we measure our success by the degree in which our um, clients and residents are able to achieve meaningful Productive lives. Our programs are tailored for each of their um, for each person's to achieve his or her own, own goals and attain to, uh, obtain a sense of independence, empowerment, and dignity. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So that sound that sounds would sound really great on an like a grant application, right? Like somebody reading that is like, yes, like that totally makes sense. Now, from your clients, for example, let's say if I'm a I'm your client and I want to be able to tell other people what I get from your organization, what do you think they would say? Um, I say that um, they get um, independence to the best of their ability, um, that they get a range of quality services um, that pique their interest, um, and for our residents, that they get quality long-term care. Perfect. So all of those things are your mission offering, right? This is the way that you would describe what you're offering. And the reason that the, that the logo of this, of this or the symbol for this mission offering is a gift is what you're providing the end user. So your, your clients, right? Your residents. And you would describe it in that way specifically on, on the business model canvas, the way that they would understand it, right? And usually this is something tangible, right? So this could be, um, in your case, it sounds like uh, you said uh, services. And can yeah. you tell me one tangible service that you offer? Um, well, again, during non-pandemic times, uh, field trips and, and uh, field trips, trips to the store and trips to the park, field okay. trips. Okay. Um, field trips would be one tangible offering, something that mm -hmm. they can, you know, they, they, that is tangible. The intangibles are independent, yeah. right? So your mission offering, so if you were to do a, a marketing campaign to reach to more customers, specifically, for example, for field trips, you would be highlighting the, the, the tangible, but mostly the non-tangible part, yeah. okay? So when you think about coming up with new, um, with new program offerings for this specific population, you, when you're thinking about your mission offering, you might, you need to think about the tangible and the intangible, right? Because Otherwise, you are going because you want to attract specifically who you who you want to attract. 
So you want to be able to use messaging that is going to be yes, speak about your mission, but it's going to connect with the with the with the customer, with the end user, person who wants to reach independent, because not everybody does, right? Um, so person who wants to reach independence wants to be able to connect and see themselves in that way um, when you're doing your 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 marketing. And so these two, the beneficiary segments and the mission offering go hand in hand. Now, number three. So how is it that we're going to foster that customer relationship? So now we have a beneficiary. We've already been able to get them to make that phone call. We know what we can offer. How is it that we're going to close the deal with them? Okay. So I already know what I'm selling. I know, I know who I'm selling it to. Um, how is it that I'm going to be able to create that, um, that relationship? And not only that, but make them um, successful, help them, help them help me reach my mission as an organization. And that is through customer relationships. And the thing that we want to think about is the way that you would foster any relationship in, in your life, right? Because we're connecting with, we want to be able to connect with people. So some examples of that could be um, maybe my email newsletter, right? Maybe um, it could be, and, and you know, for a small business, this could translate to um, coupons, right? Or this could be VIP, um, you know, uh, events. Or in some, for example, in some colleges, this could, or, or schools, this could be um, something like a, um, a certificate of some sort, a rec some sort of recognition. And within your organizations, how is it that you retain those clients that you work really hard to, um, to, to get. Okay. So what are some examples of, cu of customer relationship activities that you can do in order to retain those, those uh, clients? Because there's nothing worse than having to come up with a whole new pool of clients every time that you start a program. Right? That takes a lot of resources, time, and effort. So, what are some ways in which your organization can keep and retain and foster those relationships with those clients? Do you want folks to raise their hand or? Yeah, no, just, just shout you know, out. We're not a huge group, just, you know, shout it out. What do you do to retain them? <gasps> you don't do anything to retain them? Uh-oh. We're I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go again and I'll okay. finish. Yeah, but, but, um, so we do, you know, again, our folks do um, some social media, but it's all Facebook, right? They don't they do not do the other app, but they do Facebook. They like seeing their pictures on Facebook. They like little videos of the themes that we do and the things that they do that the, and their friends will, will sort of comment on that. So it's a way yeah. to highlight some of the activities we do. And um, then their friends will either with our program or um, maybe want to be in our program down the line or their families can sort of see that they're having a really good time and that they comment on them and said, yeah, we had a lot of fun on this field trip. We had a lot of fun doing this art project. We had a lot of fun with this theme day. Um, so we do that and we do a lot of surveying both with the, the yeah. clients or residents, but also their families to make sure that we're hitting the mark. Yeah. So those are two great examples. Surveys, doing that follow-up, right? Like, how did we do? We care about what what we um, we offered. We care about you. We care about the relationship. We want to keep you as a client for X amount of time. Um, and we want you to refer other people, right? You want to, because pe people like your, your market segment are going to know other people like them, okay? So it's going to be important to keep that relationship going. Um, so some, exa some other examples could be um, so he mentioned Facebook um, surveys. You can also do maybe um, contests, right? You can make, depending on what you, what the types of services that you're offering, get, you need to get creative. Because if there's anything about um, time today is that people have their attention divided in so many things and there's so much stress you do have to be very intentional about keeping that relationship going. So when you're thinking about developing a new program or when you're thinking about developing a, um, a whole new um, maybe organization, 
you do want to think about how you're going to retain all of those customers or clients, participants, students that you are um, that you're working so hard to reach because it is going to be much more expensive for you um, to be able to have uh, new clients every time than to be able to foster those relationships with the clients that you um, are going to be serving. And also, this is a way for you to think about how you can create fans out of your um, participants, right? So how is it that you're going to get those participants who were successful in your program? Because I know in nonprofits, one of the things that one of the ways in which we measure success is getting people out of the program Like you want people to be able to be self-sustaining or um, successful um, in your program to be able to move on to the next milestone. Right. Um, and, but you want to be able to get them to bring you more of those clients, more of those participants. Um, again, I, I'll give the example of the college I worked at. They were having the hardest time reaching this specific population. And so one of the things that we did was um, have a referral program. Why would a college have a referral program? It was, it was a community college. It was actually at Evergreen Valley College. We would have referral programs. We would have family days, right? Because this specific population we were trying to reach was one of their values was family. And they wanted to get their family involved. And many of them would ask, like, can I bring my mom to show her X, Y, and Z? I mean, it's college. It's the kind of thing you would do in high school, but not in college. But because the value of family was so strong, we wanted to engage the entire family. And that created so much retention. I mean, at one point, we would not only have the student enrolled, we would have the mom enrolled. Then the mom would bring the friend. I mean, and we had so much success in that program. But it was very intentional because we were very focused on serving a very specific population. When you're planning out your programs, you have to think about how you're going to retain clients. Okay. And that is the point of uh, box number three. How are you answering the question of how you're going to, how you're going to uh, foster that relationship with your clients. Okay. Yes, Susie. Carla, there was a question in the chat about organizations that have strict confidentiality laws and maybe how, how to bridge that. Yeah, um, so, so you don't necessarily, strict confidentiality laws as in, tell me a little bit more. I'm thinking like in a college, for example, there is um, HIPAA, FERPA, and all of these PUS, right? Like you can't share um, client information and you're not allowed to, right? Um, but if you can, if, like one of the things that we did with the students was have um, information, well, when we were able to gather in groups, we would have informational um, days, right? Or we would have gatherings where we would ask them to bring their own family members, um, you know, and it was never required, for example. The, um, the other thing, um, I, and actually, I want to know a little bit more about that because this person might not be the only one with this type of um, restriction. So, yeah, so that was me, um, Stephanie. I am in a nonprofit drug treatment organization. So we have to follow HIPAA as well as CFR 42 for substance abuse programs. Okay. Um, and I heard you, somebody mention about client incentives and that's one big thing that we're trying to work on as an organization, mm -hmm. but it's hard to promote somebody and how well they're doing with their sobriety if we can't, you know, promote them on Facebook or like post like client of the month. We can't do any of that, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And, you know, I think um, you kind of just have to get creative and, th and see and think about one, of course, like you have to follow all of the, all of the law, but thinking about what they value. So it might be that they don't necessarily want to be recognized publicly, but they want to still be able to feel recognition, right? So could it be a pin that is just specifically, in, you know, of course, it's not going to be something that is going to um, violate that confidentiality, but it could be something that just people that are part of that program know that exists, right, and are, are happy to to share you know the excitement about so could it be a pin right a, a, a process where like you know for the first um x amount of months that you participate in the program you get this pin and then you work towards the second pin kind of like girl scouts you know like you kind of earn these things and i think a lot of the times um we think that it has to be something really big something really public and the reality is that it doesn't have to be right 
a lot of the times you kind of get excited and especially nowadays like the little things are just as important as like if not more than the big things you know what I mean so I'm thinking um uh, something along those lines does that make sense does that sound fe even feasible I'm thinking I'm, I'm just thinking out of the top of my head no it definitely does yeah so that could be a, that could be a good model to kind of think about like um, you know, it could be a pin and it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, or even sharing, um, of a story without giving away any, um, identifiable information, right? Only that person knows that that was them, right? Okay. Um, any, que any other questions with regard to this one is probably, I, I say all of them are very, very important, but I think this one really get your creative juices going right? Like every time, I think it's, it's the little things and especially nowadays, and it doesn't have to be, um, you know, that big of a deal, right? This is one way a lot of network marketing companies are so successful in recruiting hundreds, if not thousands of people to these, uh, to, to these companies, because they incentivize everything. And oh my goodness, they're just like, it's so successful because people feel recognized. And that is one thing that you have to think about when you're looking at your uh, beneficiary segments, to your clients, to your students. It's the little things. It doesn't have to be expensive. It really shouldn't be expensive because you don't want this to be about um, about um, about the money, right? Or about how much it's gonna they're gonna receive because you do want them to be um, loyal to your to your um, to your service. Okay, let's go to beneficiary channels. And this pretty much um, entails you thinking about what the best way to reach them uh, is going to be. So for example, and this is why you have to know, you have to know the modes of, the preferred modes of communication um, for your market segment, for your beneficiary segment. How is it that they prefer to communicate with you, right? Um, I've done a lot of training with small business owners, um, um, Spanish speaking, monolingual Spanish speaking business owners. And one of the things, one of the biggest challenges for me was getting them to use an email address consistently and be able to have access to their email address. Because a lot of the information that I would give, I would want to send them templates, right? And, and most of the time they would tell me, I don't remember my email address. And then they want to ask their kid to help them get an email address. So it's just like a mess, right? So a lot of the times I would just have to give my phone number out. Like, just text me. I'm going to send you a screenshot of the template and then you can, you know, use it. So you have to be clear about what their mo preferred mode of communication is. Um, and, you know, and one of the things that this pandemic did uh, for a lot of people was get them comfortable with technology, okay? So when you're thinking about how it is that you're gonna provide, reach your customer, not only to develop that relationship, but also provide the service, you have to think of different ways to do that. And right now you have to think of a virtual way of doing that, right? And I mean, you kind of just gotta try different things, but don't ever be afraid to do a little bit of a market, um, um, a survey, right? Ask people. And that's one thing that I also noticed in a lot of organizations that I work for and companies that, I, that I've that i supported, all we need to do is just ask. Most, a lot of the times we don't wanna ask, we don't know what to ask, but literally people will tell you how it is that they wanna be served, how it is that they wanna be recognized. They will, if you ask, they will tell you. So very important to use the correct channels to reach your audience. Otherwise you're wasting your time and you're wasting your money. Okay, and you're wasting your organization's resources if you're if it's not going to be effective. Okay. Um, okay, so why am I going back? Okay. Impact metrics. So the first four boxes have to lead us to impact metrics and we have to have metrics and we have to determine. So if you're coming up with new ways of serving your community you have to figure out how it is that you're going to measure these, okay? Are we measuring these by, for example, hours spent on a program? Are we measuring these by, by number of participants, right? 
Um, I know that, you know, in a college it's butts and, butts and chairs. So right now it's probably butts in, in, at home in, uh, you know, in front of Zoom. How is it that you're measuring these? And you have to be able to figure out whether or not your um, boxes one through four are working. And this is the way that you figure that out, okay? In the original business model canvas, this is money made. This is income sources. And one of the things that I, um, I want to enc strongly encourage you to do that I encourage all business owners and all organization um, leaders is to think of not only the main ways in which your funders ask you to measure impact, but think of ways in which your client, your customer is benefiting that you're not measuring, currently measuring, okay? So for example, let's say someone, you, you have a, um, I'm going to give you the example of when I worked at uh, Prospera Co-ops. We provided um, training for women to develop cooperatives, okay? So they participated in all of these different programs. And one of the things that we noticed is that they, had, they, they were very quick to launch their business, for example, uh, without knowing they actually launched their business, okay? But one way in which we measured impact was also... Um, wellness, social emotional wellness. So who would think of, of an entrepreneurial program uh, providing social emotional well-being to women? Okay, so that was one way in which we started to measure impact as well. Like not only you're participating in this program, making more money in your business, developing um, uh, 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 businesses and having all of these be financial benefits, but you're also gaining self-esteem from this program. You're also gaining all of these other skills. So you always wanna be looking at what impact metrics you can add on to that list. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you wanna be able to have these conversations and, and be attuned to how it is that you're not, you're creating um, impact besides the obvious ways, okay? Let's speed it up. Okay, so this side of the business model canvas is really about operations, right? So what is it that I'm gonna need? So the key resources, what is it that I'm gonna need in order to make boxes one through five run, okay? And so the key here is the word key. So there are some things that are nice to have. Most things are, in, in, are nice to have. And there are some things that are key that are extremely necessary in order for the model to run. So for example, a key resource for my bicycle is two wheels, right? In order for my bicycle to run, I'm gonna need those two wheels, right? But I don't necessarily need the latest model seat on my bicycle, okay? I need a seat, maybe, but I definitely need those two wheels. So when you're thinking about what, a, what it is that you need, and this is why the box is so tiny, and this is why this needs to be on just one page, is because you're gonna need to narrow it down to the key resources, and which leads me to box number seven, which is the key activities, okay? What is it that it needs to happen in order for me to be able to make this um, program run, okay? So I'll share with you when we first started the program at the college, we didn't have an office. We literally had, all I had in order to start that program was a computer. That was it. And so I didn't have an office. There was no um, lending library. There was nothing except for me, some information and a copy machine. One second. Chiquita. Thank you. That was my cat. So, um, so it, a lot of the times when we're thinking about starting a program, we're thinking like, we're going to need $20,000 for X, Y, and Z. We're going to need blah, 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 blah. No. In order for, the, for us to test out a program or, or think about an, a new um, line of business within our organizations, we want to think about what it is, what the um, minimal viable resource and activities are needed in order for us to make it happen. Okay. And so I want you to make that list and check it twice and think about what is it that I need in order for the, for the model to continue running. Some things are nice to have, other things are absolutely necessary, okay? Chiquita? Okay, 
Um, and that is, that is the difference between, um, that is, that's what makes this a business model canvas and a one pager. And that's what makes it successful. That is going to help you determine what is key and what is not. So key activities, for example, for a program, um, um, a, a, a drug recovery program, what would be one key activity? Stephanie, I think it was you, Stephanie, right? So what is one thing that needs to happen in your program in order for the program to exist or to run? We need clients. <laughs> right. And for many of you, that's the case, right? So one key activity is going to be outreach. Like if you don't do outreach, and I've seen this happen, I've seen this in organizations where they have the best program that happened to one of the organizations I worked for. We had an awesome program. We just could not get people in the door. For some reason, we could not get people in the door, right? So our marketing efforts may, you know, were, were not being effective. Maybe we weren't having the, the, me, the, the right message, right? Um, so for us, it was important to move, literally physically move ourselves into the neighborhood we wanted to work in because again, transportation was a big issue for our customers, right? So one key activity is, is, is outreach, right? You're not gonna be able to survive without it. You can have an amazing program, but without outreach, and for most of you, this is gonna be a key activity, right? Another activity may be um, having the right staff right? Having a, a pool of staff who's going to have specific types of skills, a specific skill set, right? It could be, you know, making sure you have that pipeline of staff. It could be having uh, locations or it could be, I think one key activity for a lot of organizations in the recent months has been technology, right? Having an actual infrastructure or maybe even having um, an IT person, that might be, I might actually go under key resources. Like we are not gonna make this happen without, without an IT person. So, um, so that's, the, that's the difference, right? Like what would be an activity that is not necessarily key, it would be nice to have, right? Maybe, we, we, maybe a, a nice to have activity may be a retreat for our staff. Do we need a retreat for our staff in order for the model to run? No, not necessarily, right? The model could run as long as we have maybe a counselor and a, um, and the client, right? So that is the difference. So, so, and I'm not saying they're good or bad. Don't hate me. They're like, you know, if you guys are big advocates of like the, the retreats and the, and the, <laughs> all of those, uh, activities, but they're not necessary in order for the model to run. Okay, so that is a big difference, which also leads me to key partners. Now, when you're thinking about who you need in order to make this run, it could be maybe you're a funder. Maybe your program may not necessarily be able to run without money. There are some programs that can run without money, right? But um that may be that may be someone a key a funder it could also be a specific staff person that all, that has a specific skill set right um it could also be um definitely your clients are key partners right um it could also be um maybe a partner that has access to your client base right Maybe another organization that you want to partner with that already has that client base as well. Okay. People, give me an example of someone who may not be a part, a key partner in your business or in your organization. I think it's just as important to recognize what shouldn't be on this sheet. What would be one example of a partner uh, or of a uh, someone, a key partner? Excuse me. <laughs> no, I was going to ask if anybody wanted to just share. You can unmute or you can type in the chat either way. 
For me, it would be the county of Monterey. Um, that's where we get some of our referrals and that's our funding source. Okay, so that would be a key partner. Perfect. If, if, if your funding source could be a key mm -hmm. Yes. But, but it could also, if let's say you have an idea of providing a full on volunteer run program, you want to be able, because I know for many organizations, um, and, I, and I worked for a nonprofit when the, um, when the economic downturn happened in 2008. And one of the biggest conversations that we were trying to have was how do we wean ourselves off, off of the dependence that we have on foundation money. And I think there might be a foundation on, on this call, but how is it that we can stop relying on found, foundation money, on grant money, or maybe a specific grant that we've been relying on and live in, that has been our, our lifeline for the last few years, right? So if you're thinking of ways, it could be, it, it could be that your business model is trying to reflect this um, um, figuring out how you can how you can gain other sources of money, and you don't want to put this as a key partner. How is it that we can diversify our um, our income streams, right, to not include this specific partner? So that might be somebody you might want to exclude from key partners, okay? And when you're thinking about new business models, and that gets you start you know to start thinking about other ways to create revenue. Okay, so it's just as important to think about who doesn't belong on these boxes or what doesn't belong in these boxes as who does and what does belong in these boxes. Does that make sense? So let's say you decide, okay, I am gonna remove this, this uh, funder from this list. So now let's figure out how we can make the model run without them. Okay, so that's the way that would work. I know. it's, it's it, it, it's one way in which you can play around with this model. Number nine, does that make sense? I feel like I went, I went on a little bit on a tangent, but I think it's just as important, especially because we don't know how the economy is gonna be. And I, a lot of the times we're thinking about how we can make the program survive. And I know that many times we find ourselves just responding to funder needs or funder metrics instead of what the customer actually needs, what our beneficiary needs. So when we're thinking about using this model, let's take funders out of the equation and think about other ways in which we can diversify our, um, our model, right? And this is one way to do that. Cost structure, right? Um, so what is it that is going to, what are gonna be our big ticket items? What do we have to spend money on? specifically for this model to work. And that is what needs to be on this list, okay? What do we have to spend money on and, and emphasize on have to, okay? Because remember, this model should be saving you money, should be saving you time. You're pretty much shedding all the, all the, um, all the nice to haves and all of the extra weight from launching a program, a new program, maybe a new initiative. Um, you're basically trying to figure out how you can do it in the leanest way and fastest way possible. Okay. Questions, comments. I have just a, a general question. Okay. Why, why is this laid out in this manner? Um, because it's, it's supposed to, do you mean like in one page or in? No, just the, the randomness of it, how it because bounces from not, one, uh -huh. it from seems, the far right to the middle, to the size of the boxes, you know, so it's, yeah. what, so what, it's what, what's the motivation to, behind that? So for one, it, it all needs to fit in one page. And, and so that way, you pretty much can do this in an hour with a team of people like it pretty much gets you it it prevents you from getting stuck in the details it kind of it's supposed to help you arrive at very specific concise uh information okay so this is like they call it the one page business plan yeah it just kind of seems random i can yeah. i can see it so, from a brainstorming standpoint but it it just kind of you know, if you're, so, if you're talking about something and then all of a sudden you're 
somebody brings up something that has to do with cost structure, you're bouncing to it. Yeah, so this is this area. So one through four. So you go here uh, and okay, so let me let me um, I usually start with mission offering. So I start right here. And the reason that I, that I wanted us to start over here this time is because most of the time when you Google search business model canvas, which I know many of you probably will after this, you're going to find that it, it you get started on beneficiary segments. So you figure out that there's a need, right? There's, there's someone out there that needs help. Um, and then you have the solution, which is the mission offering. So all of this has to do with the customer. And so it really, it's supposed to go together, right? So this is just about the customer. And then this is about your everything at the bottom has to do with money in this case because you're not necessarily receiving money from your customer it's impact metrics but in the original the, the bottom two are just about the money and then this is operations so customer okay money, operations yeah that's that makes just, more sense mm -hmm. yeah that's that's how the original is but this one's adapted for uh program um for nonprofit programs specifically. We'll take a look at, um, thank you for your question. Yeah, it, it seems it seems kind of random, but that's the reason why. So this might make more sense. Um, so this one specifically for donors. So that one was for your clients and this is for donor segments. I wanna know if any of you have ever segmented or, or you know figured out who specifically is giving to your organization. Okay, so this is specifically for donors. Anyone, anyone interested in growing their donor base? And this is specifically for individual donations. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yay! I see a lot of head shaking. So you can do the same process for your do for your donors. So one of the things we want to think about is who's giving or who is most likely to give, right? Um, and when we're thinking about about that, we can and it depends on how comfortable you feel thinking about a specific market. So some foundations, for example, are very specific about who they reach out to. So the, uh, I'm thinking about the Latino Community Foundation. They know they're reaching out to Latinos, right? They're reaching out to Latinos and then they then they have these affinity groups, right? Or they have the, not affinity, but like they have these um, age um, specific groups or women or gender groups. So when you're thinking about segmenting your donor groups, uh, group, make sure to, to be as specific as possible again, right? Or even look at who has given, and if you're not collecting information from them, like their age or maybe where they work, right? That may be something you wanna know, what, kind, what they do for a living. If you're getting a lot of people who are retired, you wanna be able to have messaging and a donor center value proposition. What is it that they're getting out of it, right? To be able to reach more people like that because if they're already giving money to you, they're already responding to your, to your mission and your messaging, you wanna do more of that, okay? And the more specific you are, the more effective you're gonna be. So you wanna segment, it, segment your, donor, um, your donor base. And if you, again, if you're not collecting information right now, you better start collecting information. At the very least, you want to know demographics about them. And you can incentivize that. A lot of the times I get people who are like, oh, people don't want to give out their information. Yeah, they do. They do it all the time for minimal things, okay? We're so used to being open about our information that we don't even notice we're giving it away, okay? So it's okay to ask. And it's okay to give people an opportunity to decline. But don't... Um, don't not ask just because you think they're not going to give you information okay so you could do something um how many of you are collecting donor information right now like specifics like maybe age gender um, where they work anyone okay so it is a good idea to start you want to know who's giving to you and how you can reach out to them okay and you also want to know who's not being asked one thing that amazed me um, when I participated in a in a um, 
in a in a program. I think it was the Latino Community Foundation. It was it was a foundation, but they were talking about how there are these specific groups who never get asked. One of them is Latinos. We never get asked to give, but we're very generous. But most organizations don't have these specific messaging to be able to reach reach out to us, right? To be able to give. So that's a huge market a huge demographic that you could be reaching out to if you have a donor center value proposition. You have to give me a reason to give and pull on my heartstrings in a way that is going to get me to give, right? But it has to be very tailored and specific to me, okay? But you have to know who I am, right? Um, and, and what is important to me. And in the same way, you want to have a strategy for for don't for um, managing that relationship, and you also want to want want to let um, reach out to me in the way that I'm that is the best to reach out to me, and that is a donor channel, right? And then you figure out revenue streams. Okay, so now maybe people can give donations, maybe people can give their stock, maybe people can give their time. Or maybe they have assets they want to sell, right? And they want to give away, right? But you want to think about in what, in what ways can I receive these resources? And how is it that I'm going to continue to actually uh, foster that relationship? And it's the same methodology that we use for, um, for beneficiaries we would use for, um, for, for these donor segments. And they have to connect with the value proposition. They have to, they have to be donor centered. Okay. Does that make sense? So this is one way in which you can use the business model canvas to benefit your organization. Okay. So you can develop new programs or think of how you can develop new programs, right? You can also use this to brainstorm with other team members right and in, in ways in which you can retain your clients right and and you can figure out all of the important aspects of it um you can also use this to maybe figure out other other revenue streams um, one thing, a, a, a few examples of how um, other, other revenue streams that you can actually start thinking about is can you, do you have team members that have a very specific skill set, right, that may not necessarily um, be benefiting programs that may have to, that had to shut down because of the pandemic that could be sold, right, to other nonprofits or to other clients, right? So one of the things that you can think about is like, what is your inventory of skills that you have within your organization right now that are that are assets to your organization? You can start there, right? Could you maybe have a consulting wing to your organization? Could you have maybe, um, you know, right now there are so many, there's so much information out there but maybe for your target demographic, there may be another target demographic that would be willing to pay for your ser free services, right? So you don't have to offer them for free. It could be tiered, right? So for example, um, when I was doing cooperative development, we knew that there were businesses that wanted maybe to churn um, that were not cooperatives, but they, they wanted to become cooperatives. But they would be willing, they wouldn't qualify for our services because we were trying to reach low income women, right? So then we were able to have an offering. That was actually an idea that we floated around. Like, how do we offer this to people who are willing to pay for it? And then that could be a revenue stream for our, our organization that doesn't depend on the generosity of the foundation, right? So instead of having 90% of our income or of our revenue be foundation money, could it be, could we get to a point where it could be 60% because we have all of these um, services that we're able to offer and people are willing to pay for, right? Could, uh, could we teach an online class, right? Like there, are the, there is this institutional knowledge that you have maybe you could you could test that out like figure out like what how you can sell your institutional knowledge 
for maybe maybe not for um, your competitor, but maybe for other types of nonprofits, right? So figuring out how you can turn all of these assets and you have to have an inventory of assets for your organization, including tangibles and not and non tangibles intangibles um, for your organization. And even thinking about how you can, um, you know, and, and this is why I asked how many of you think you're entrepreneurial. Many of you who, if you're working in a program, you for sure have entrepreneurial skills. You're always thinking of ways to improve the program, of creating more program offerings. And now it's more thinking about the way in which you can um, monetize from them. Maybe not you, but the, or the organization, helping the organization monetize these programs. And the business model canvas can actually help you um, figure out and make a case for it, right? So those could be some ways. Um, have any of you thought of different ways in which you can apply the business model canvas? What is one maybe general idea that you have that you want to use um, the canvas for? Hi. Yes. So we had some feedback. Yes. Um, Carmen, I'm not sure if you have two uh, microphones live, but that could sometimes cause that problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's still there. I mean, it's still there. Uh, is that better? A little bit. Um, okay. That's better, thank you. So I wanted just to say that, um, we, we've used this uh, uh, for uh, our own programs. And I think this is something that you can do for the different programs that we have. We used it when we were starting uh, to do our store for our kitchen incubator. Mm -hmm. So we actually did went through the process of doing the, the canvas and, and it's there. <laughs> and we think parts of it So uh, the other thing is that right now we are uh, thinking that we need to like redo our training programs. And this is a tool that we may need to use because we, we have to do that. So uh, I, I have not told Carla about this one, but, but I just think that you can use it for each of your programs. And I just wanted to share that. And if you, if you wanted to, I know we're going to have a follow-up session on the 2nd of December. So if you wanted to draft something up, I am happy to provide, it be a soundboard and provide a little bit of feedback or just kind of reaffirm some of the ideas that you have. I'm happy to be to do that with you. Um, it is super helpful to put it down on paper, right? And to be able to have uh, a way to um, communicate this in the simplest form possible, right? Because a lot of the times we're thinking like, I just need to do a full on program planning um, booklet, right? To be able to get started. And the reality is, is that we're living in a very fast paced and, and, and changing environment, right? So everything's changing every day. Um, and it's going to continue to do so. So this could be a tool that will help you kind of narrow down what is important, what what it, what has been working, what you need to know. Maybe some of you have now realized, I don't know who we're serving, right? I, I there's definitely people coming to our trainings, or maybe there's people coming to our to receive services, but it just seems random. Like, how do we get more of this specific type of person that is going to help us increase? our metrics or, or be, or, you know, be successful on, on, on paper, right? So how is it that we're going to be able to do that? So for, um, and, and I think that this, it's a super valuable uh, exercise to do with your team as well. Um, and it's also helpful to know what you don't know, right? Like, how is it that we're going to, do we know what are best channels to reach donors is, right? How are people being reached out to now? And a lot of the times you're gonna see that you are um, underutilizing technology, right? And it's, it's a very underutilized resource. And so you wanna think about, there are so many different channels out there 
you want to think about what the best one for your audience is going to be. And you want to be intentional about each one of these. And that's what makes you eventually um, save money, right, for your program. And you want to be able to run a lean program, especially, uh, and, you know, and selfishly, at least for me, thinking about how you can make your own life easier, be effective, and get the most bang for the energy that you're going to be putting out there, right? Um, and so I kind of want to hear some ideas that you, maybe a general idea, or I know um, not everybody feels comfortable sharing our, their ideas publicly, but if you want to share um, one idea that you're planning to put on paper on a business model canvas, I would love to hear um, the, what to expect for the follow-up session on December 2nd. Uh, Carla, we do have a couple of things in the chat. Okay. Um, sold treasures and read to me had a couple of ideas that they're um, planning to do okay wonderful gallery option uh -huh. yes asking donors for individual for their information absolutely that it and i'm telling you we are so used to giving our information that it that you know a lot of the times we don't get it because we don't ask for it Okay, we're just so used to it. and you know there's ways of incentivizing it as well right um, you can do a raffle you can do. Um, you know, I would say like get creative um, so that you feel good about asking people for their information and um, that's your that's your book of business right like your list of donors people who. Um, who want to give you want to be able to have as much information on them as possible to be able to uh, reach more people like them hi carla um this is libby from the reach me project and that was my idea um i i admit to being uh like intensely private which is not why i don't have my picture up there it's just because i'm making dinner literally while i'm doing this and i don't want to like mess up anybody's screen um so um i am intensely private and i know a lot of our donors are older um, and I know a lot of our donors are teachers who um, have to be very sensitive about their information because it's really easy for people to get upset with a teacher about all kinds of things. And there's a long sorted history of this. So um, I'm kind of in teachers and retired teachers. So um, what do you think about the option of um, allowing people to choose, like on a Google form, whether to be anonymous or not? Because yes. at least that way, if I have like 10 people who are from Nature Ripe, I get yes. to go to Nature Ripe and say 10 of your employees are, and yes. I don't have to ask them who they are. And also, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of blended families and we work with a lot of them. And if you have, you know, 20 people here in your family and, you know, you've got one Nana who doesn't have papers, you're still terrified. Yes. So we're really, really sensitive about asking people about their information. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think definitely give people an op the option of, of uh, providing the information anonymously. What you want to know is just basic information, right? And you don't necessarily have to tie it to a name. You just want to be able to create this persona so that you can reach out to more people like that. So you, it doesn't have to be tied to a name, okay? So that's, that's an excellent point. And then um, for one of the programs that I work with, uh, I was working with a lot of undocumented um, people and one and so like there were two programs that two examples that I can give you and this is why I feel certain that if you ask for it you're going to receive the information one you do have to reassure people that their information is going to be secure and you have to honor that promise okay for it and it doesn't matter if they're a vulnerable population or not you want to be able to protect people's information either way you don't want to get your organization to get into a um, a legal um, situation and just, you know, ethically, you want to be able to protect this. You want to have those those uh, parameters in place or the structures in place before you start collecting information. Number two, um, so the, the example that I wanted to give you one, we would explain to people why we needed this information, right? We need this information to be able to get more money, right? We need to this and be able to fulfill the mission. This isn't just for us. We, we want to be able to serve more people. And in order to do that, we need to report, um, you know, general information about who we're serving or, gener or, or we want to be able to reach more people like you. We want to be able to grow our community. Okay, so those are some ways in which you can um, word it. And, and essentially, that's what you want to do. You want to be able to grow your community, whether it's your donor base 
or whether it's your client base, okay? The other um, pr project that I worked on, um, it was called the US Financial Diaries Project. And we were under the impression, so our, our job was to do market research for this, um, for this cause. And we wanted to know how, how this specific um, demographic was serving was spending and earning their money, okay? And money is, you know, is one of those issues where you're like, I don't want to tell anybody, or at least most people are kind of assume that other people don't want to share about their money. I was amazed at how surprised people, how I was amazed at how open people were about the specifics about their money. We just explained to them, like, we just want to know. And here's the thing, people want to share, especially now, I feel like it's about connection. People wanted to share so much about their money. I kid you not, I learned about, I, I interviewed 36 families for a period of about two years about everything that had to do with their finances. Talk about intimacy. We knew everything about them. And of course, everything was confidential. It, it was never tied to a name. But they were very open to it. And that's when I learned, and I can reassure you that people want to share with you their opinion. They want to share. So if you do a, mark, a little bit of market research about their values, you want to have conversations with them to learn more about your donors, to learn more about your, your clients in order to learn to increase your probability of your program being successful. Just ask. Okay, learn how to ask these questions, feel comfortable asking, and also feel comfortable with people saying, no, I don't want to share that, and give people that opportunity as well. It's okay, but I think more often than not, people want to connect and they want to share, and overshare sometimes. <laughs> okay, good questions, and I hope, I hope you do that. I hope you definitely start collecting more information so that your programs become more successful. Okay, diversifying fu funding. We only get 3% of our funding from foundations and grants. Awesome. Okay, that's, is that, I'm, I'm hoping that's a good thing, Robert. I'm not sure. Okay, so, so most of your, your donors are uh, individuals. So it's about figuring out who these individuals are, right? Um, or maybe you charge for services. That might be it too. Okay, think of different ways to use our assets, such as library and the knowledge of our members. Absolutely. Yes, you have a lot of um, institutional knowledge. You have a lot of um, uh, different types of assets, your team. And, you know, a lot of the times it's underutilized. You know, you got to think about what the biggest impact is. And here's the thing, this, this um, business model canvas methodology is used for business. And the reality is that business is trying to save money and make more, right? So how do we get as much from, from a little bit of effort and resources, right? And so you want to be able to do that for your organization as well, have big impact um, without having to, you know, um, use up a lot of energy, especially nowadays. I feel like this has become so much more relevant especially with everything that's been going on um, around us this year. We definitely have limited um, energy, limited capacity, limited everything. And we've had to switch the way in which we do our, our work and we serve our communities. Um, I always thought that I wasn't gonna be able to do online trainings for Latino community, um, Latino business owners, and here we are doing training for, you know, small business owners that are monolingual Spanish speakers. And I love asking people, well, this is the first time you joined Zoom for a training. And, you know, and now um, at the beginning, it was like, everybody was like, yeah, it's my first time. Towards the end, it was like, nope, not my first time. I, you know, I'm a pro now. I love it. And, you know, and, and I feel like all of us could use some innovation and also without having to use up a lot of energy. So, and this is a great, a great way to do that. I'm hopeful that um, you will participate in the follow-up. And I don't know if you want to do a, a plug for that, Susie, but um, please use me as a resource. I want to hear your ideas. And remember, this isn't a contract. The Business Model Can Canvas doesn't commit you to doing anything. It just, it's a tool for you to dream and put it into action. 
Yeah, thank you, Carlo. I think the idea behind uh, the December 2nd follow-up is just a chance to circle back. Um, we've got a big holiday in the midst of all that. Yes. So just a, a chance to maybe try one piece of it, maybe you know apply it a little bit to, to a program or to one aspect of, of your work, or maybe even just open a conversation mm -hmm. with a team member, board member, um, to, to, to think a little bit about how, how you might apply this. And then the, the session will be just a chance to share back and get any other further support or clarification. Um, it is optional, but we definitely invite everybody to come back. Yeah. Thank you. I will send Susie um, the template for this. Um, remember, it's just one page and it should stay in one page. That's a big part of the, the, the it's key to success for the business model canvas. So I'll send it to Susie so that she could share. Okay. Wonderful. Any final questions? I want to be mindful of your time. I know that it's almost five o'clock, but I want to make sure that um, I answer your final question. Yeah, it, this is Alan. So, um, you know, so we're a little different. We're not like, you know, a have a specific purpose like a you know storefront type of operation so we have you know camaraderie as part of you know getting together and having you know uh friends and stuff like that so that's part of it uh and part of it is going out and doing projects and then we raise money and then the you know and then we give it all away um so um you know i'm kind of thinking there's two different aspects one is you know well you could have from the member standpoint you could have from from you know the project standpoint that raises the money, and then you could have the beneficiaries from the beneficiary standpoint. So, it it, it almost you know seems hard to do in in one model. So, any advice? Yes, um, do one model per market segment. So That's one right. model. I can. Yeah, for donors, one model for. Um, let's say your scholarship recipients, I think you said you provide scholarships. Right, but it's a lot of nonprofits, scholarships is a lot of it, but anyway, yeah, so for the people that receive the money, right? Yeah, I would say base it on that. Yeah, base it on that. If you find that you have, um, oh, you know, you can try that part, or you can also think about what your value proposition is whether whether it's for donors so like if you have different ones that you know you have to stick to then you can start there so do one model per value proposition okay or per, um, okay model. makes sense yeah so those the uh, box one and two are going to guide you and don't don't try to fit like 10 different segments on the one uh, model because it's it's not going to work you can't sell the same you can't use the same model for each segment so just focus on one or two and and use you know you can print out as many of these as you as you want and and use them as templates definitely play around with it yeah that's my okay, thank you mm -hmm. well thank you again so much carla and um thank all of you. you for participating today and um have a safe and enjoyable evening take care thank you everyone yep, take care everyone find me on linkedin same name Okay. Thank you. Marketing. Thank you so <laughs> Good night, everybody.